Good evening. This is the Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, May 17th, 2023. This is your chair, Steve Conklin, and I call this meeting to order. Uh, Melinda, you'll be taking a uh, roll call in just a moment on here, correct? That is correct. At this point, uh, please rise, uh, if you're able, where you are, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you. Yes. Okay, everybody together now. I'm not used to doing this solo. <laughs> I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, of America. And to the republic which is stands one nation under God, 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 God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh. Maybe we should have had one person do it solo, but anyway, thank you all very much, Melinda. Uh, if you would take roll, I would appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a reminder, uh, if you are not unable to respond when I call your name, I will make sure to check back at the end of roll call. All right, here we go. Steve Odoricio, Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Present. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Solzman. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that you, Claire? Okay. Uh, Ashley Solzman, Boulder County. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. James Marshall Shane, City and County of Broomfield. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marling, Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Also here. Thank you. George Teal, Douglas County. Also here. Wonderful. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Art, Jefferson County. Leslie Dahl Kemper, Jefferson County. Here. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer, City of Arvada. Dustin Zvonek, Aurora. Juan Marcano, Aurora. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Royce Pindell, Bennett. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Margot Ramsden, Bomar. Here. Dan Plowski, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Present. Thank you. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Present. Todd Williams, Central City. Here. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Earl Holland, Cherry Hills Village. Present. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Okay. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Ryan Toucher, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Present. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan, Lions. Greg Edding, Lions. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Here. Richard Kondo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. 
Neil Shaw, superior. Yeah. Oh, mm. is that Sally? Thanks, Sally. Yes. <laughs> All right, Neil Shaw, superior. Sandy Hammerly, superior. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Bruce Baker, Westminster. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. All right, and then um, I'll go ahead and ask for uh, a show of hands for anyone that I did call on and they weren't able to respond at the time of roll call. Okay, we have Lisa Smith, James Marsh Fulshane, uh, Greg Edding, Mayor Bud Starker, Lynn Baca of Adams County. All right, wonderful. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum and I will hand it back to you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, first up, do we have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Lisa Smith. Lisa Smith, I move to approve the agenda. Thank you, Director Smith. Uh, Director Starker, I assume you're a second? I second the motion, thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 I love the virtual delay in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> any opposed? And any abstentions? Great, thank you. We have an approved agenda. I appreciate that. Moving on, report of the chair. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for, for your involvement tonight. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time that you spend and your dedication to Dr. Cog. Want to thank everyone that made it to the retreat uh, this weekend, whether it was the Friday dinner or the retreat on Saturday. We had folks that could be at one and not the other. And I know we had some folks that weren't able to be there, but we really appreciate everyone that was able to be a part of the, uh, the retreat. Also want to thank staff for all they do all the time, but especially the work that they did uh, for the retreat this weekend. That is my report. At this point, we'll move on to Commissioner Jeff Baker, performance and engagement. Thank you, Ms. Performance and engagement um, meeting was canceled for this evening, so um, I'll give another report when we have a meeting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Whitlow, report on the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you very much, Chair. We had eight resolutions passed by this great finance and budget committee tonight. Um, we got through all eight in 45 minutes, so I'm I'm super happy that everybody came to the table um, with questions and comments and all of the research done prior to. So thank you very much. Some of those those eight items um, we authorized the the executive director to do a numerous um, amount of things. So Doug, you're you know. Another month of, you know, slow, slow working. Just kidding. Um, the first one we negotiate, he uh, authorized him to negotiate an executive contract with the Y2K engineering to create a school transportation plan for Edgewater and Lumber Elementary School in the amount not to exceed $80,000 for a 12 month term. We um, authorized him to author, enter a, in a cooperative agreement with the United States Environmental Protection Agency and a total amount not to exceed a million dollars with a term through federal fiscal year 2027 for the Climate Pollution Reduction Planning Grant awarded to Dr. Cog. Next, we had him extend, he's going to extend the uh, Human Resource Transportation self aside contracts awarded for vehicles purchased through 2022, combined transportation super call to December 31st of this year. And also extend the Laird and Hall Society's contract awarded for vehicles purchased through 2022, combined with the transportation super call to December 31st of this year. We also asked him and um, was approved to authorize to continue a contract with Colorado Department of Human Services State Unit on Aging for approximately $432,000 for the period of July 1st of this year to June 30th of next year to support Dr. Cog's, Dr. Cog's Aging and Disability Resource Center. We also issued a contract with the providers for AAA Choice Service Program up to a million dollars for transportation services and up to $784,000 for in-home care services for the state fiscal year from January 1st of this year through June 30th of next year. 
We also allocated additional federal and state funds for approximately $686,000 to AAA services providers for the state fiscal year ending this year, June 30th. And last, we extend a contract to Nimble Science for a mobile fall prevention program in the amount not to exceed $662,300 for the state fiscal year ending on June 30th, 2024. And our next meeting will be June 21st, 2023. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity and thank you for the Finance and Budget Committee for all the work that they did. Thank you. Thank you very much. And having sat in virtually on that meeting, you did amazing work getting through all of that uh, agenda. So thank you for your work on that. With that, I'll turn it over to Doug Rex for our report from the executive director. Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I do echo uh, your sentiments towards uh, uh, Director Whitlow. She did a great job in maneuvering through that agenda. Another busy one. I do want a special shout out to administration and finance for all the work that they're doing. And in, in contracting in that it's a lot a lot of work as you can imagine we you know we have a small shop over there but they do they do wonders there's no doubt about it um i also wanted to echo um uh, just a big thank you to everyone that was able to to make the board retreat this past weekend i i think there was a lot of energy in that room um so i'm real appreciative of the conversation we have and i do think you know there were some you know significant takeaways some clear takeaways from that um, as you all know, most of the agenda was centered around housing, and the main takeaways are, are certainly related to that. So we'll begin to be rolling this out to you. Um, so we'll um, yeah, at our at our uh, Jan June seventh board work session, we have planned to bring back to you uh, a drafty scope for a regional housing a regional housing strategy that we talked about in the meeting, and for an opportunity for the board to provide some additional comments on that. Um, and then the hope is that we'll uh, bring at your June 21st meeting uh, an item for action to, um, uh, to you all to allow us to proceed forward with that. Um, based on the conversation that we had at the board retreat, we do understand that we probably need to be in a place come December of this year that, uh, that certain tasks of that regional housing strategy should be complete in order to better inform us as well as the legislature as and the governor's office um, about ways that the legislature can help us local governments in um, in uh, you know this 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 housing crisis that we find ourselves. I think it's uh, so we're really excited about this opportunity. It's going to be a tremendous amount of work and and um, and yeah. So we'll be talking more about that in a couple of weeks. So thank you also very much. The last thing I want to mention real quick is bike to work day. Um, Staff is really getting geared up for it. The, the event is to be held on, Jan, on June 28th. Um, we are expecting a pretty big turnout this year, perhaps even approaching pre-pandemic levels. Cross your fingers. Um, and we do have some, some pretty exciting news tonight as a way for us, um, a way for you to help us promote the event. Um, you're eligible to receive a t-shirt or t-shirt a hat free of charge. Um, and I know Melinda is probably going to drop a note in the chat here in a second, a link that um, uh, with a bit more detail. She sent an email to you earlier this week as well. But please, if you're interested, get your orders in by May 26th so that we can get those back, uh, those T-shirts and hats back out to you all in, uh, in due time. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move to public comment. We have up to 45 minutes allocated for public comment. Each speaker was limited to, is limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. Uh, the chair requests that there be no public comment on issues which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Uh, also, and action items will be begin immediately after the last speaker. Ms. Stevens, do we have any public comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our first speaker is Randall Logue, so I will go ahead and allow him to speak. Randall, you should be able to unmute yourself and begin. Welcome, Randall. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, it's, as always, a pleasure to be here, and especially to hear your um, interest in housing. I'd really love to peruse that report and uh, see how it aligns with what we're doing in the state with Proposition 123, and how and I remember I was at the at the presentation about that from the Division of Housing and how we can make it possible for people um, to be safe and sound throughout their lives. 
Um, so I'm, I'm delighted about that. And as a bicyclist, as a routine bicyclist, uh, a, a daily commuter, uh, I love the uh, bike to work, and I also promote it a great deal. I would advise you to do those uh, pull over your head uh, little um, uh, sleeves that you can wear to keep out dust and so forth. I particularly enjoyed being able to be at the event at uh, the city and county um, park right there um, in the past years. Um, and I also commend the work that you all do, um, which, of course, is vital to creating an infrastructure of collaboration and support for all of the citizens. And as usual, uh, I can't pass the time without rem reminding you that the light rail and the um, commuter situation for workers like myself um, that work uh, diligently into my 70s and hopefully my 80s um, is vital to our survival. Um, since we don't drive, many of us, and rely upon the public transportation and the um, co-transportation co of other um, means to survive and to get to work and to get home. Uh, so thank you for your time and attention to these things. And as usual, I'm a, uh, an A1 supporter of Dr. Cog. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate that. Other public comments? Uh, at this time, I do not see any other. Oh, yeah. At this time, I do not see any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. We will move ahead to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the summary of the May 3rd, 2023 meeting. Also, the fiscal year 2022, fiscal year 2023 Unified Planning Work Program or UPWP amendment which is in the packet. Do we have a motion for the consent agenda? Uh, Director Maurer. Um, I move to approve the consent agenda. Right. And Director Starker. I will second the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, no? And any abstention? Great. Thank you very much. Consent agenda is approved. Moving on to action items. Uh, the first action item is uh, a huge action item for us tonight. The discussion of the Dr. Cog fiscal year 2023-24 budget. And uh, Jenny Dock, Director of uh, Administration and Finance, will present. Thanks for being here, Jenny. Thank you, Director Conklin and, um, and Board of Directors. I appreciate your time. Um, can you confirm with me that you're seeing my screen? We are. All right, great. That's a plus. So lots of meetings on Teams, not so much on Zoom. So I appreciate your patience. Um, Melinda, if you can just let me know if I need to change anything, that would be great. Um, but again, thank you, Chair and Board of Directors, for allowing me to present to you the fiscal year 23-24 Dr. Cog agency budget. So hopefully you've had time to review the draft budget in your agenda packet. And for those of you who are new to this process, I will just let you know that the budget process actually begins in February and March. And during this time frame, staff collect data and projections on health insurance, premiums, cost Jenny. of investments. Jenny, Matt, yes. Mr. Chairman, if I may, this is Doug. I, I think your presentation is just spinning. Can, can you try to advance the slide real quick? Can you see it now, Doug? Yeah, it's not advancing, at least on my end. Is it anybody else seeing the second slide? Uh, it's just the cover sheet or the first page. Yeah. Okay, so I'm showing the annual budget process timeline. Yeah, we, we can't see that. Well, would, it help, a... would it help if you went to slideshow and did the full screen? Yeah, that might. Presentation mode or... Slideshow. Yeah, up at the top where it says slideshow. Oh, click that's on just slideshow. advanced to the big picture. Oh. There you go. All right. How about this? There Can you, you go. see the annual budget process timeline? Yep. Got it. And it might okay. make it big. It might make it bigger for us if it could go into presentation mode. Uh, but if not, that's fine. Don't want to don't want to overlay. Yeah, when I click that, that's when you all couldn't see it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. 
All right. So, I mean, the good news is that you get to see, you know, the preview of coming slides. <laughs> But um, however, so I do want to go over the, the process and the timeline of the budget. So um, during the first phase, you'll see here that in February, March, um, staff actually works to comprise the budget. And during this time frame, we're collecting data on um, projections on health insurance premiums, cost of living adjustments, and trends within our member jurisdictions as it relates to market adjustments, merit pools as well as other economic factors. And at this time, the division directors work with their staff to draft a budget that's representative of the initiatives their division will embark on in the coming year. And then in March, the division to budgets are reviewed by Doug and myself to ensure budget neutrality and fiscal integrity. Uh, this budget is brought before the Finance and Budget Committee for their initial review, and this gives the committee time to ask questions and suggest revisions if necessary. And those questions and considerations are taken into account by staff if modifications are needed, adjustments are made at that time. And then I'll just note that on April 19th, the budget you see today was brought before the Finance and Budget Committee for their final review. Uh, the committee voted at that time to recommend approval of the draft budget to the board of directors. And tonight we ask for your review and approval of this budget. Next slide. So the big picture. So our beginning general fund balance for the upcoming year is projected to be approximately 11.8 million. And this is a pretty healthy beginning balance for the organization. Um, our auditors typically recommend that we maintain a fund balance equal to approximately three months worth of operating expenses. So based on the fiscal year 21-22 audited statement, that would suggest a fund balance of approximately 11.4 million. So considering the agency growth over the past two years, we are pretty much right in line with where we are supposed to be in terms of maintaining a healthy fund balance. Our revenues are expected to reach approximately 37.6 million with expenses matching those revenues in the same amount. Uh, Dr. Cog's programs basically operate on a dollar for dollar reimbursement uh, from our grantors. So most years, Dr. Cog's budget is neutral. Our pass through funds are expected to be dispersed in the amount of $22.8 million in fiscal year 23-24, bringing our total operating budget to approximately $60.4 million. Revenue sources. So this slide represents the diversity of our funding streams and their percentage of the overall budget. You'll notice that Federal funding actually remains our largest source of funding overall at approximately 67.5% of our total operating budget. So if you added all of our federal funding resources together, it totals about $40.7 million. And then our state sources of funding come in second at approximately 24.5% or $14.8 million. I'll also point out member contributions, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but they represent 3.4% of the total operating budget. So member contributions, I know that many of you think, wow, what do our contributions actually pay for? So I think it's a great opportunity to share with you what they really do pay for. And I have to tell you, um, the bottom of the slide says your contributions help make our region great. And it's really a true statement. Um, member contributions really play an important role in the fiscal health of Dr. Cog. So in fiscal year 23-24, member contributions represent approximately 3.4% of the total operating budget. But um, member contributions are really important. First, I'll say that they're calculated based on each jurisdiction's population and assessed valuation from the most recent economic report published by the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. But I will tell you that um, what member contributions do for Dr. Cog is first and foremost, they pay for match requirements. So in this fiscal year, that will account for about $1.6 million. 
So for those of you who don't know, we do receive certain federal grants that require us to put in a certain amount of cash match to receive those grants. So without your contributions, we would not be able to accept those grants. So and a, and a big um, majority of that would be in the UPWP and also in the AAA. So your contributions help us fund those programs and, and really are very, very important. They also fund our legislative efforts. So this fiscal year, that will be about $350,000. Uh, federal grants cannot be used to pay for, for any type of lobbying or legislative work that we do. So your member dues contribute to that. Also other activities that support member jurisdictions. Um, so those would be the small communities hot topics forum, our quarterly city and county managers forum, which I think many of you have benefited from. Um, that's a great forum for information sharing our annual board workshop and other programs as well. So I hope everyone understands that what you contribute to Dr. Cog really does make a difference. Year over year growth. So moving on, I wanted to provide a snapshot of the agency's growth year over year. So you'll notice that in 2017, the total operating budget has more than doubled. So from 29 million to 60.4 million, over the last three years, the operating budget has grown about 32.5%. So needless to say, this is significant growth in a short period of time. Uh, through 2021 and 2022, there were a number of grants that we received related to COVID relief and the Inflation Reduction Act. However, there are other long-term programs which have contributed to this growth as well, such as our Veterans Directed Care Program, being direct recipients of federal transit administration dollars, human services transportation funds, and also an increase in state and federal funds year over year in the AAA. So this is a pretty impressive slide. I started here in, um, in 2014. So when I look back at this, I think, wow, we really have changed and, um, and grown and diversified our funding. And I think that's really a positive Good news story for the organization and for the region. This slide represents our budget neutrality. So despite the growth in these programs, you'll notice that our general fund has increased only slightly. So this signifies that Dr. Cog practices fiscal, fiscal constraint um, in its general fund spending. So we want you to know that we are being responsible with the way that we spend uh, our member contributions and our general fund overall. And lastly, when speaking of agency growth, I think it's important to speak to its impact on staffing and the organization. So since 2017, Dr. Cog has added 27 staff members, and this is an increase in staffing of almost 25%. The largest growth has taken place in the aging division with only a handful of administration positions added to support these growing staffing levels. I'd also like to point out what attrition has looked like at Dr. Cog during this period of growth. Uh, you will notice that pre-pandemic, our attrition rates averaged between 10 and 13%. Our, our human resources director is here, Randy Arnold, and he can speak to this, but those pre-pandemic numbers are on target with, with most in the government sector. However, in 2020, like many other organizations, attrition spiked nearly to 20%. Um, although we saw this happening across many job sectors, Dr. Cog did take the spike, didn't take the spike lightly. So although Dr. Cog had always had a rich benefits package. Leadership decided that a holistic approach to employment compensation was important. So as a result, attrition um, over the last 12 months has steadily decreased each month. And to date, the 2023 calendar year, we're seeing less than 5% attrition. And I would think that many of you could probably speak to this as well, um, of the trends that you saw throughout the last several years of um, where attrition spiked and then, you know, and then has gotten back to, to, you know, lower levels. But I think it's important to note some of the things that Dr. Cog has done with employee retention efforts. 
So we definitely recognize that staff are the lifeblood of Dr. Cog, and we're proud of the talented people that work hard every day to make our region a great place to live. And I often say this in interviews when people ask me, why do you work at Dr. Cog? Well, it's not only because of, you know, just having a job, but people here actually really take pride in the work that they do. And we really have talented people. So some of the ways that we wanted to make sure that we were having this holistic approach um, is noted in this slide. So first I'll just note that in 2022, Dr. Cog enlisted the help of Employers Council and that we conducted a class and compensation evaluation. And as a result, a number of increases were given to employees in April and July of 2022 to ensure that Dr. Cog was offering fair and competitive wages. Additionally, Dr. Cog sees the impact inflation has had on our workforce and has offered market adjustments or cost of living adjustments over the past two years to help offset the increased cost of living in Colorado. Another measure that we've taken was um, coming up with the Equity Action Committee. So Dr. Cobb recognizes the importance of fostering an inclusive work environment as one of a number of the diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives of Dr. Cog. Um, Dr. Cog's EAC committee was formed in 2021 and this committee is staff driven internally and they're focused on advisory um, panels that work closely with human resources and senior management on diversity and equity topics. I'll also note floating holidays. So one of the actions that the executive um, or the equity action, equity action committee recommended was that there would be more flexibility in our holiday schedule. So as a result, Dr. Cog has modified its holiday schedule to include Juneteenth and two floating holidays that staff can use to recognize days that hold significance to them. We also have an adaptable work environment now. Um, I think that everyone would agree that COVID made many folks stop and reevaluate the importance of a healthy work-life balance. So in response to staff surveys, Dr. Cog created a Dr. Cog adaptable work environment platform, which affords for teleworking, compressed work week schedules, and flexible work hours. And finally, I'll just comment on our generous leave time and competitive benefits package, which include um, a, a, a very high percentage of contribution of Dr. Cog's dollars into employee health and benefits, dental benefits, and also retirement. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I will open up the floor for any comments. We also have the division directors here to offer any comments on program specific related matters. Jenny, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, questions, comments, discussion? Linda, I'm not seeing any hands. Are there hands that I am not seeing? Uh, no, I see the same thing that you do, no hands. I get the impression that just means it was that awesome of a presentation. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> okay. And Jenny, what action do you need from this group? Just that you would uh, vote to approve the proposed 23-24 fiscal year budget. Fantastic, do I have a motion? Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will make that motion to approve the uh, 23 24 budget as presented. And I also want to say thank you to Jenny and her staff. I know a lot of work went into this. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair. I uh, second the motion. Fantastic. Any discussion before we vote? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Great. Jenny Doc, you have an approved budget from the board. Yay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate all, all of your work and uh, for the great presentation again. Thank we will you. Move ahead with the agenda to our next item. Uh, item number 10, discussion of the fiscal year 2024 through 2027 Transportation Improvement Program or TIP, a sub-regional share call number four. 
and the foreign rec forum, forum recommendations. Our presentation tonight leads off with Todd Cottrell, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Todd? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. Uh, so this evening's uh, presentation and action is surrounding the sub-regional share recommendations from the individual eight forums that most of you or some of you are involved with. Um, and ultimately, this is going to help develop a new transportation improvement program um, covering federal fiscal years 24 through 27. Um, this is the last call, call four in which we've uh, worked to allocate $455 million over the last year and a half, two years. Um, so we are finally in the home stretch. And I, sometimes I can't believe it when I say that, but we are almost there. Um, the first two calls that took place last year were to program um, additional funds for the, the existing transportation improvement program they have. Um, again, calls one and two. And as we moved into calls three and four, um, these are uh, projects that are going to fund a or to fund projects for a new tip that we're developing again, the 24 to 27 tip. So a little bit more in detail about the call for projects. Um, the call for uh, was open from the end of November to the end of January. Um, and this was to fund um, over two different tracks, the air quality multimodal track and the STBG track. STBG stands for Surface Transportation Block Grant. Um, this is a federal funding source that, quite frankly, is the most flexible. Almost any type of project could be funded out of this. The air quality and multimodal track is a combination of our remaining uh, state and federal funding sources. Um, there was a couple of advantages within this track. Um, one, the most noticeable really to reduce that federal minimum match on those projects being submitted. And of course, within this uh, track, projects also did have to contribute to air quality reduction um, and, and congestion reduction. So those individual applications um, in the early and early part of February were submitted to each of the forums. Um, the individual uh, technical committees or your forums yourselves went through a process to to score, discuss, and really recommend those projects within the funding targets that were given to each one of these forums. As part of calls three and four, there was also wait lists that were developed. Um, so those are included in part of this recommendation. And before we get into the individual projects summarized in that table below, um, I did wanna just take a moment to sort of recognize that even though this was call four, there were the three other calls for projects um, that really provided sort of a unique, unique atmosphere um, to this sort of set calls for projects. In a normal situation, there would only be two calls to program a four-year TIP. This time there was four. So I think from a sponsor perspective, um, when they were submitting for this call for, or quite frankly, any, not, any of the other calls, they were really looking at what type of project they were considering uh, which years that they would like to submit for. So that might have played into sort of which call one through four that they would submit into. So again, as I mentioned, the table sort of summarizes the projects that were submitted and those forum recommendations, both the projects that were individually recommended and those projects that happen to not be recommended, but placed on those wait lists. Um, so if you're like me trying to do the math quickly, um, that might not work out directly for you as some of those recommendations were only for partial funding. And of course, um, the remaining funding for that funding, remaining portion of that funding for that project would be placed on the wait list. There was also a public comment process. Um, this is relatively new to Dr. Cog, and essentially what we're looking for is to seek those public comments before the individual forums made their recommendations, and certainly before um, the board was looking at making those recommendations in those previous calls. So the public comment period for this individual call uh, took place over the first 22 days in early February. Um, the public was able to comment directly on a web map that Dr. Cox staff created. Um, they could also submit their comments through email or phone. Um, there was an e-blast that went out to notify the public of this. And of course, we also made those postings on our social media. 
On this web map, uh, the public was able to indicate support, concern, or whether it was whether it be opposition for an individual project, in addition to adding their own comments if they chose to do so. Almost 1,100 comments were received for Paul Four, and again, like I mentioned, forums were able to use this information within their deliberations and ultimately their recommendation that you're seeing tonight. So next steps, uh, just before we get into the proposed motion, um, in approximately a month, we will we'll be releasing this document um, for the public comment period on, on the draft 24 to 27 tip. Um, this will take place over 30 days and conclude at your July board meeting, where we will be having a public hearing. We will turn right around at the Transportation Advisory Committee in July, and then be coming back to you in August for um, action on this draft document. As part of that public hearing and what we'll bring back to you in August, we're going to take a few moments and really look at a high-level summary of those previous calls so that everyone can get an idea of when we're collectively looking at the, all four of these calls, what sort of um, investments that we were looking at for uh, for the region. So happy to take any questions or comments you may have, but the proposed motion before you would be to move to recommend the sub-regional share projects to be included within the draft 24 to 27 tip. Dr. Dietz. Yeah, I'm going to move to recommend the sub-regional share projects to be included in the draft FY 2024 to 2027 tip. Great, and Director Teal. Second. Fantastic. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion uh, before we vote? Questions? Director Teal, your hand is still up. Did you have uh, a question or comment, or is that uh, residual? Mr. Rex, have you got a comment? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, at, at least acknowledge the tremendous amount of work that has gone into these four calls. Um, from Dr. Cog's staff, but also from the staffs within your own jurisdiction. Um, it's a lot, right? I mean, four calls is an awful lot to do to accomplish over a short period of time. Um, and really, you know, the, the coordination of these sub-regional forum meetings, um, whoever is doing that within your sub-region, most of the time it's county staff. I really, truly want to thank them for, for their diligence in uh, getting us to where we are today. And and uh, of course, big shout out to Todd and, and his folks. They do such a wonderful job. And I think uh, staff within your communities would agree with that. So thank you also very much. Absolutely, thank you. And having been on this board through the process of the discussions about changing the TIP process and what that would look like and how that would go. And you know, I, I, I think the, the, the work that a lot of people put in and a lot of the feedback the board gave has paid off well with the process. So I, I echo your thanks to uh, Dr. Cog's staff, county staffs, uh, our folks here that are that are on those uh, regional, sub-regional calls. And it doesn't look like we have any questions or any comments outside of that. We will move to a vote. All in, uh, Director Flynn. It sounded like you were soliciting a question. So uh, uh, <laughs> just, just to prolong the meeting, I'd Actually, I would like to ask one. It's a matter of interest to me, uh, uh, having analyzed the Denver uh, sub-regional uh, recommendations over the last four calls. But Todd, would you happen to know offhand, and if you don't, that's fine, maybe let us know afterward, how much of the four calls, $455 million, went to uh, roadway projects solely? How many went to uh, transit projects, how much of the dollars went to uh, uh, bicycle and how much went to pedestrian? Is it possible to break it down that way? I know that a lot of the multimodal, it's it's so intertwined, you might not be able to slice and dice it. But I think that would be an interesting number for us to have going forward. Thanks. It, it would, and thank you for the question, Director Flynn. Um, I have some information that I could probably share for calls three and four, but it would not include calls one and two. Um, and I, I think sort of what you were getting to at the end is very rarely is there a single project that really just does one thing. 
Um, right. Maybe transit is is the exception to that, but most other projects that do involve a roadway will include some sort of active transportation component or transit stop component or maybe goes right. a step further and really works to complete streets. So um, I, we certainly will, can bring that information back um, at the next two opportunities in July and August. And I think we'll have a complete picture of what these four calls uh, really got to. Thank you, Todd. I'd really like to see that. Uh, uh, not an urgent request though. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Very good question. Director Teal. Thank you. No question, Chair, but I'd, I'd actually like to double down on something you said. And because you and I, uh, a couple of folks that are on the call tonight were here when we redid the governance of Dr. Cog several years ago. And I really thought you, you hit it on the head that the TIP process used to be extremely divisive. It used to be, uh, I, I think uh, one of our colleagues called it the gladiator games. <laughs> and that is not what we have now. Now we have... Uh, counties, municipalities working together, collaborating. And so um, I know there are many new members who were not here for those days, but um, you know, good for all of us for keeping the promises that were made back then on how to govern uh, as a body, as a region in collaboration. I speak in favor of the motion. Great, thank you. Not seeing any other comments. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Great. Thank you much. The motion to recommend the subregional share projects be included has passed. Thank you very much. And with that, we will move ahead on the agenda. Uh, informational briefing, uh, item number 11 is an update on the status of the RTD fast track projects. And Jacob Brigger, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations is presenting. Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Just a quick introduction here before I turn it over to RTD. Um, Dr. Cog and RTD have some review and coordination responsibilities to each other. Um, and those are articulated in a resolution that the Dr. Cog board passed in all the way back in 2013. Um, that was linked in your memo for this agenda item. And the basic framework of that resolution is that each year RTD produces what's called a fast tracks annual report so that they can report out to you and to the region just where are we at on, on the Fast Tracks program and what's happened in the last year. Um, they submit that report to us by May 1st of each year. Uh, we review it, provide comments back to RTD, um, and then they come to you as they are tonight to give a presentation about that report. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Susan Wood, Planning Project Manager. I think I got her title right at RTD uh, to talk about this year's Fast Tracks annual report. Susan? Susan? You did. There we go. So sorry. I'm trying to share my screen, so I got a little flustered. Um, uh, Jacob, I am having a little problem sharing. Or Melinda. And I apologize to you. I thought I had it queued up. Oh, we've oh. got it there on the screen, Susan. Very good. I thank you so much and thank you guys for your patience. I really appreciate that. As Jacob said, I'm Susan Wood with RTD. I'm really pleased to be here talking to you tonight uh, to talk about our annual fast track report to Dr. Cog. This is our report for 2023. Um, and next slide. As Jacob said, we prepare this report on an annual basis and have done so since 2004. Um, that items that are in your report tonight and or that was were in your packet and you have tonight and items that we cover in all of our fast tracks reports include the status of the fast tracks project and then fast tracks financial information and also in the report that you have is an update on the northwest rail peak service study next slide so this chart, if you were here last year, you've probably seen this chart before. This is a list of all the fast tracks projects that have been completed at this point in time. This actually represents about 75% of the fast tracks program. 
the last uh, line that was completed was the North Metro commuter rail line from Denver Union, Union Station to 124th Avenue, and that was completed in September of 2020. Next slide. And then you also had this table in your, in your packet. And this is a table that shows the Fast Tracks program expenditures and budget through the end of this past year. So the left column are the millions of dollars that were split, spent through, actually that should say spent through 2022. And in the right column is the total project budget. In many cases, this is one in the same. In some cases, it's not exactly the same. One example I'll give is the Eagle project where you can see there's a difference in the money spent. It's a little, the total project budget being a little more. This project is in the process of being closed out, but it hasn't quite closed out. So there are federal dollars that are still in, in the project budget. When the project's closed out, any re remaining dollars will go back to the FTA, to the federal source. Next slide. So also in the report and, so with, and some associated tables are also included is a discussion on the 2023-2028 midterm financial plan. The financial, the, there's a midterm financial plan that actually about tonight is really just fast tracks. That report or that financial plan was submitted to the RTD board uh, in September of 2022. It's important to note it's a six year financial forecast, but it's not in and of itself an appropriation of funding. There's a budgeting process that goes beyond that and with a budget that's approved by the RTD board. The midterm financial plan is based on a balancing planned expenditures with anticipated funding. And it's also important to note that it also uh, includes it includes an approach based system funding at this point will supplement fast tracks. It does allow service levels to grow over time. And so the cost for operations then therefore grow over time to meet those service levels. And that, those are consistent with the service levels that are assumed in the reimagined RTD system optimization plan. Next slide. Also included in your packet is information on the FISA or the fast tracks internal savings account. Um, the, that first bullet is actually incorrect. The FISA actually, uh, the FISA account was actually created in 2013 and has been uh, on the book since that time. It's intended to be used to fund completion of unfinished fast tracks corridors when that funding becomes available. Um, there are eight sources that contribute to what's in the FISA and the total to date, the total balance is about $207 million forecast in 2040 to be more than $525 million. Uh, at this point in time, the utilization of these funds has not been determined, but the RTD board will consider this and take action at a future date that also has not yet been determined. Next slide. So one of the biggest things that we have had going on for a while now, and I know that you are aware of it, and some of you may be participants in it, is the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. We all know Northwest Rail is from Denver to Longmont. It's a 41-mile corridor along the BNSF rail line. Uh, phase one was completed in July of 2016, the B line, which goes from Union Station to Westminster. And the Peak Service Study is about phase two, which is from Westminster to Longmont. So the, the, then the study will evaluate the feasibility of peak period service, and that's three, three trips in the morning and three trips in the evening. To do that, there are five milestones that are established. We're currently at mile, milestone three at this point, and that's underway. Uh, important is that uh, throughout the life of the project, which been, began about a year ago uh, in April of 2022, is that there's been a great deal of stakeholder and citizen outreach done, and that will continue throughout. There are most important, I think, is there's a study advisory team that's been established, and that study, study advisory team includes uh, participants from the jurisdictions, uh, from, the, from the TMAs, and other interested parties. Uh, so we get a lot of good input uh, that contributes to the study. That group meets um, once a month at least. Um, again, some of you may be members or your staff may be members of that group. It's also important to note that the, the, peak, uh, the peak service is included in the 2050 Metro Vision RTP and the 2040 to 2050 horizon. Next slide. 
this just shows the schedule. A lot of work is being done. A lot of things are being addressed simultaneously. And again, a lot of outreach. Again, the study began about a year ago. We're in milestone three. And uh, the plan is to conclude the study late in 2023. Next slide. And that's the question slide. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I will say a big thank you to those who have shared their screen and helped me out tonight. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Director Mulvey. I, I have a small comment, um, and it's somewhat off topic, but it's relevant, I think. As one of the four representatives that Dr. Cog appointed to the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board, if you look at page 71 of your package, you can get a feel for where the Front Range Passenger Rail might go in Denver and up to uh, Longmont that green dotted line along the BNSF tracks, which was where um, the Northwest Rail was uh, intended, is one of the strong considerations for the Northern part of that route. I get a lot of questions about that, so I wanted to mention it. I'm glad you brought that up. And I will just add that there, I know that Front Range Passenger Rail is on a little bit, bit different time track than we are with Northwest Rail, but there's still a lot of com communication that goes on and, and the recognition of the opportunity to share information that we gain and the opportunity to share information that Front Range Passenger Rail gains. And so that, that will be done. I think there's a great deal of synergy to be gained there. Great, thank I, you very I much. Would, if I may. Please. Thank you. I would agree. Synergy is probably um, a mild statement in terms of what is um, being sought for collaboration to effectuate the fast tracks objective. Thank you. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm. <laughs> it's just just the right time of day where there's a lot of light coming in. I can't figure out how to orient it. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to kind of follow up the question that Deborah had. Um, I was kind of wondering um, something similar, just sort of where where are those synergies and how is the peak service being designed to coordinate with the Front Range Passenger Rail? And I was just wondering um, if you could give us some examples of the ways that those um, synergies are being thought about. Right well, now. I will tell you what I know at this point in time about, about what's going on process-wise. I know that meetings occur at an executive level, and those meetings one day will also occur at a staff level um, where information will be shared. You know, I know that personally working on Northwest Rail, I've re received some environmental information. I mean, that's what I do. I'm an environmental planner, which has been helpful to me. And likewise, because I realize that our, our segment of what, what will be front range passenger rail someday is not large, but yet we are gathering some very detailed information to offer back. And so that is happening as well. So there are ongoing conversations at this point. I think that it's yet to be determined how exactly the information gained is going to dovetail together. But I think that's exactly where we are in the study at this point is starting to learn those things. And it's really important. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I have one other question, but I noticed um, that somebody else has their hand up too. And I don't know if that was in response to the similar yeah, shake, topic. Shake or... it, yeah. Uh, kind of, it, go ahead. Yeah, it is, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much. Um, Susan's answer is completely accurate. I just wanted to add a, a little bit to that and supplement that. Um, during the consultant procurement phrase phase uh, for the North, Northwest Rail Peak Service Study, uh, which I served on, there were representatives from CDOT and folks who were representing um, the interests of Front Range Rail. Um, and we got into some of those details. I don't want to get too much in the weeds tonight, but things like, um, you know, train links, platform links, um, those sorts of things. So that's been that's been part of the calculus from from day one. Um, Susan is correct. The two projects are on different timelines. There is more coordination to be had. Um, but RTD, uh, CDOT, 
And the Front Range Rail Commission did sign an MOU, I believe it was, uh, within the past year, explicitly around that coordination data and information sharing to facilitate that. And I think, Jacob, that you may brought up another really critically important point is that it's a very technical process. And so understanding how the two services will knit together, thinking in terms of car links and, and um, technology and things of that nature, um, that's gonna be key. And there'll be a lot of work done around that. Great. Director Spear, your second question. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for all the work that you all are doing uh, to, to find those places of synergy. So this was um, just in, in the uh, midterm financial plan for um, RTD was indicating that the base system funding would um, supplement Fast Tracks, the Fast Tracks program. And I was just wondering if you could expand on that um, a little bit, because I, I think, you know, one of the things that we continue to be a little bit worried about is the um, that the system optimization plan is not going to return service to our area as quickly as we'd like. And so just, you know, how, how are those base system funds, um, will it impact the system optimization plan and bringing that to fruition um, with some of the base system funds being going toward fast tracks? I, I feel certain that those are considered together, but separately and that the system optimization plan is intact, it's been approved by our board. So I don't anticipate seeing that compromised in any way. And I can understand your question. You know, I asked that same question about the base system. How does it supplement fast tracks? Because I, and probably that's why I'm, I even sort of zeroed in on it because it's something that stands out to me. And I think it's because the base system preceded fast tracks. And so the two systems really, the two, I guess you can call them systems. The two systems really are together and do work together. In other words, we utilize the same infrastructure. We utilize the same staff. We utilize the same, the same rail cars in some cases. So, so you can't fully tear them apart. It can't go the other way where fast tracks supplements the base system because the base system came first and it, it is, it's the infrastructure and the underpinning for, for what we do. Thank you, appreciate that. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate the presentation. Thank you. With that, we will move ahead, call your attention to a informational item in your packet, administrative modifications to the 2022-2025 transportation improvement program. And uh, Director Rex, I'm correct that that is just a, a in the packet. I correct. correct. No presentation yes. on that. Fantastic. With that, we will move ahead to committee reports. I request the reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and uh, information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. We will start with the uh, report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee and Director Nicholas Williams. Director Williams. Can't hear you. Try that again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stack met earlier this month. A uh, few items of note. First off, in the legislative discussion, uh, HB 1101, uh, something that went through the legislature, originally started life as a uh, free fares ozone bill, uh, but through amendment, um, started to bring into some items dealing with uh, transportation planning regions and those boundaries ultimately uh, ended up as uh, a study uh, on that. And so we will certainly track that as that moves forward. Uh, also, uh, some good discussion on, talked about a little bit last month, preparatory program distribution discussion uh, on here. Um, so about every four years, CDOT uh, reviews the different funding program distributions for four different programs. Uh, this is transportation alternatives, multimodal options funds, metro plan, metropolitan planning, carbon reduction, surface transportation block grant, uh, and their uh, CMAC program. That was definitely more than four uh, on there. Uh, and so those discussions will be moving forward here uh, uh, starting next month um, uh, and will be done uh, kind of one, one source per meeting uh, on there. And then finally, the uh, draft 2024 through 27 STIP was uh, recommended for approval to the Transportation Committee. Ends my report. Happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Any questions at all? Seeing none, we will move ahead to the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, Wheat Ridge Mayor Bud Starker, Director Starker, please. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The caucus has not met since our last meeting, so I have no report tonight. Thank you. Those are the great reports. They're 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 concise that way. A uh, report for Metro Area County Commissioners, Jeff thank, Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think at our last meeting, I mentioned the I gave the update for our 421 meeting. Uh, we're meeting again this Friday, so that concludes my report. Great. Thank you very much. Report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla Sanchez Warren. Sheila. Hi, everyone. We had two wonderful presentations from um, organizations that we fund. Capable is one of those. Uh, this is a program that combines nursing care with occupational therapists, with home modification and repair to help people uh, remain in their homes longer. Um, the goal is to achieve better outcomes, decrease medical costs, um, and they're doing a really great job. It is such a cool program. The new thing about this is that now they got a grant so that people who qualify for Medicaid, which Medicaid recipients were never eligible for this program, now they are. And so it's very exciting to help people get some of those needed home repairs, um, you know, just, uh, ramps built, uh, hallways widened, that kind of type of thing. Uh, the, the second presentation was uh, from the Center for People with Disabilities on their Beyond Vision program. This is a program for people who are visually impaired and blind. Uh, they talked about how they uh, work with people on independent living skill training for those people who have gone blind quickly um, uh, and usually from a disease process. Uh, they talked about assistive technology, peer support, and communication services. Really important to help people stay connected after they've had a sudden vision loss, and that's really difficult to do. So those presentations were really wonderful, and um, uh, you know, show us the the importance of community-based services in our in our region. That's my report. Fantastic. And serving in the ACA along with uh, other directors, uh, the, the vision presentation was especially interesting. My mom is from some vision issues, and I just thought that was incredibly compelling. Uh, and this is an aside, but I would encourage all of us and we, as we work with our municipalities to think about those folks that are, are low vision and a lot of things that are very creative design-wise are really tough for people to read that may have some of those vision issues. So just a, a thought to, to keep that in mind. Thank you very much for that report, Jayla. Uh, we'll move ahead with a report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Doug Rex, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The RAC met uh, on May 5th, this, late earlier this month, and I just wanna mention two presentations that we had. The first was on front range ozone monitoring overview. Staff from the Air Pollution Control Commission and RAC uh, provided a, uh, I mean, it was it was probably the best, most comprehensive monitoring overview that I've ever seen. They talked about um, uh, monitor placement, data collection, quality assurance, all that kind of good stuff. They did a wonderful job. And the last thing I would want to mention is um, we also got an update on the development of the 2023 Severe SIP. You may recall uh, the, the withdrawal of last year's severe ozone SIP from consideration by the Air Quality Control Commission uh, required a re-examination of uh, certain sectors of the inventory sectors, and we concentrated at the last meeting on the oil and gas emission inventory. So um, it was a, a very comprehensive presentation. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you very much. Report from the E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Sorry, you had to unmute there. Um, E470 focused on the financial and audit reports. Everything is on track. Um, another thing financial was the selection of an IT vendor pool and contract sent or contact center consultant. And the significant thing there was they did an objective evaluation, but also evaluated for whether or not there was sufficient staffing and planning to meet the needs of the contract. Um, there was also a sale of land for CDOT to construct a turn lane for safety on Gun Club Road. And that's about it for the action items. Of okay, thank you very much. A uh, report from CDOT, Darius Pakbaz, Pezbuck, Pakbaz. I'm sorry, Darius. No worries, Chair. Um, I think the set, uh, first and third time it was correct, but no worries. Um, <laughs> um, Two out of three ain't bad. 
uh, yeah, no, that is that is uh, that is a majority on there. Um, some uh, some events for that are upcoming. Uh, CDOT Region Four, which is the Northeast region of Colorado, is holding their project priority programming process meetings, otherwise known as 4P. Uh, the uh, Region Four, Dr. Cal. Dr. Cog counties are Boulder County on May 24th, Weld County on May 25th, and Weld County again on June 22nd. So uh, feel free to contact me if you would like more information and I can get you in touch with the appropriate staff. And there are some open grant, federal grant opportunities. There is the Safe, safe Streets and Roads for All. Uh, CDOT is happy to support eligible local applications with letters of support. Those applications are due July 10th. Wildlife Crossings Pilot Program applications due on August 11th. I think CDOT and Douglas County are preparing an application for a potential project. And then the PROTECT grant, which is improving resiliency on surface transportation assets. Those applications are due August 18th. And that is the end of my report, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And a report from RTD. Susan Wood, you're back. I am. I'm still here. Um, Actually, Brian Welch sends his regrets that he wasn't able to join tonight, but he did give me a bullet pointed list of things we have going on that he knew you would want to know about. Um, RTD will open our initial call for projects partnership program on June 1st. A question and answer session for prospective particip participants will be held on June 8th, and the first round of partnerships will be recommended by the Subregional Service Councils in July. So that's underway. Um, Respect the Ride, which is RTD's initiative to create a welcoming transit environment, which will include an update to our code of conduct, will be, the, be before the board of directors on June 27th. RTD's received over 1400 survey responses on this topic and encourages additional submissions through June 2nd. And you can go to the rtd-denver.com website and search for Respect the Ride to submit your survey response. And I know we would like to have as many responses as we can. Um, also the fair study and equity analysis is nearing completion. The board of directors has provided overall guidance and will take action on proposed fair and past program cha changes in July. A great deal of public outreach and engagement has been done and that'll be reflected in the proposed changes. Um, RTD is also requesting permission from FTA to conduct a one year fair, a one year zero fair for youth pilot which would begin in September, 2023, following the conclusion of Zero Fare for Better Air in July and August. And then the last one is that our Transit Watch app is now available in Spanish, so. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things for me real quick. I want to acknowledge, I think we had more alternates on tonight than we have in many of our meetings to the alternates. Uh, Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. So thank you. Good seeing you. If this was an in-person meeting, we would greet you personally. And right now I'd be telling you how to get out of the parking garage. But I don't have to do that given you know, that we are virtual tonight. Uh, our next board meeting is June 21st, 2023. We'll have a work session before that. Correct, Mr. Rex? And with that, any other matters from members? Seeing none, thank you all very much. Thank you for all you do. Appreciate you being here and we'll see you next meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye.